Hello and welcome back. In this Black Exilist presentation, we will be addressing the Black homeowners appraisal gap. Welcome to BlackExcellence.com, the site where we share Black excellence, opulence, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. Home ownership lies at the heart of the American dream. Not only does home ownership represent success and opportunity, it is also the foundation of generational wealth. However, for many African Americans, home ownership is a dream deferred. For much of the 20th century, the devaluing of black lives led to segregation and racist federal housing policy through redlining that shut out chances for black people to purchase homes and build wealth. This has resulted in billions of dollars of loss to the black community that could be used to invest, start a small business, send kids to colleges of their choice, or pass down significant inheritances to the next generation. In this original Black Excellence video, we will highlight the devaluation of black neighborhoods. So without further ado, let's get started. New research shows that 50 years after laws were put in place to stop the use of race in real estate appraisals, homes in neighborhoods of color are still being undervalued. But it's not just a neighborhood thing. Black homeowners in white neighborhoods are getting the short end of the stick as well. Let's dig in a little. During the 20th century, segregation and Jim Crow forcibly lowered the quality of neighborhood conditions for blacks and impeded their financial ability to move to better opportunities. This occurred through systemic policies and other mechanisms, including redlining, zoning, blockbusting, and steering. As the result of the dynamic and the continuation of housing policies that excluded the black working class, many black neighborhoods suffered from lower quality housing, limited access to good schools and neighborhood amenities, and even exposure to environmental dangers. Also, it should be no secret that the implicit associations that white appraisers harbor in their subconscious spurs feelings and attitudes about property values based on characteristics such as race and ethnicity. These attributes and stereotypes have played out in the real estate industry through the undervaluing of black assets, in particular black homes. The National Housing Act of 1934, which established the Federal Housing Administration, or the FHA, gave birth to this practice of redlining, a tactic in which banks literally created residential security maps with red lines that designated where to avoid making loans. The FHA made it harder to obtain mortgage insurance and federal guarantees in these black communities, so banks avoided approving mortgage loans in those communities. Furthermore, white policymakers believed that newly integrated neighborhoods would decline dramatically in value and ensured that African Americans were denied mortgage subsidies and insurance for any homes in those areas as well. The abhorrent practice of redlining was carried out so well that less than only 2% of homes insured by the FHA nationally between 1946 and 1959 were available to people of color. Even though the FHA-driven redlining became illegal after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1968, the legacy of redlining has forever depressed the appraised value of land and properties in predominantly black neighborhoods. And although the laws have changed, not much is different almost 100 years later when black homeowners are asking for a fair and equitable appraisal of their homes. Even in the post-civil rights era, many forms of land use regulations were deployed to perpetuate segregation. Complex webs of covenants and zoning ordinances across U.S. cities were superimposed on already highly segregated neighborhoods to help slow and even prevent integration. These racist policies and practices helped exclude blacks from home ownership based on a family's economic circumstance, which further entrenched racial segregation. Highways and runways were built right through the middle of established black neighborhoods with the deliberate purpose of damaging or cutting off the community. 
Real estate agents were complicit in a practice known as steering, where they would direct or recommend black home seekers away from wealthy or well-to-do neighborhoods. And on the other side of the coin, they would direct white families away from very diverse enclaves or would stimulate blockbusting. This was the practice of inducing fear in white families that would prompt them to sell their homes out of grave concern that too many black homeowners in their neighborhood would bring their property value down. This was coined as white flight when large-scale migrations of white homeowners sold their homes in a frantic attempt to escape from more racially or ethnoculturally diverse communities. Racial bias has also led to gaps in amenities between black and white neighborhoods. For instance, areas with a high share of black residents are likely to have less access to green space in parks than white neighborhoods, or schools in minority neighborhoods are much more likely to be underfunded than those in white neighborhoods. There were three major factors that contributed to this. First, local municipalities and politicians simply diverted local money away from black neighborhoods or strategically funded projects that benefited their local communities or those of their allies and friends. Secondly, local governments fund public schools, libraries, parks, sports centers, infrastructure, and transportation projects through the use of property taxes. And since property taxes are determined by the home values in a particular zone or neighborhood, systematically, the white communities with higher home values would be the biggest benefactors of better funded public services and desirable neighborhood attributes. The third reason many black owned homes suffered from the lack of access to public services is because of the historically discriminatory urban and regional planning. African American communities historically were forced to live in undesirable and unfit land. In many instances, these were low lying areas where corporations, businesses, and nonprofit organizations don't want to invest their infrastructure, time, and money resulting in undesirable and unsightly communities. Many low-income black families were forced to live next to coal-burning plants, toxic factories, refineries, and other environmental hazards that not only led to dismal property values, but also led to persistent health issues, lower life expectancies, and chronic diseases. The quality of housing in majority black neighborhoods differs from less black neighborhoods in terms of age, size, and structure. The median home in majority black neighborhoods is 12 years older than homes in neighborhoods where blacks are less than 1% of the population. These older homes are also smaller, by nearly half a room, and are much less likely to be detached single-family homes. Not only is the housing stock of lower quality, but so is the surrounding neighborhoods in several important dimensions. Another aspect of redlining that the federal government institutionalized was the process for valuing how much a property was worth. This process used neighborhood racial and socioeconomic composition to determine home values. And of course, homes in white communities were deemed more valuable than identical dwellings in black neighborhoods. Racism is baked into this system. Legislative action in the late 1960s and 1970s prohibited the practice of redlining, but the law allowed appraisers to use past sale prices to determine home values. In real estate speak, this is known as pooling comparables, or comps. Real estate professionals and appraisers pool comps by looking for at least three comparable homes that are in close proximity with, let's say, the same square footage, number of floors, and number of bedrooms. They will use the recent sale prices of these three homes to put a value on the subject house. But as you can see or may have experienced firsthand, it's not an exact science and there is a bit of subjectivity and bias that can creep in when one is relying on factors other than the property itself to influence the appraisal. These contemporary appraisal practices are the reason for the large disparity. 
The process of pulling comps should be done away with since it gives way too much latitude to individual appraisers' racialized assumptions about black neighborhoods. Many feel that crime is the biggest driver for the loss of value of black neighborhoods. However, the Howell and Corver Glenn study used a statistical regression model that held some variables constant. Things like the size and amenities of a house, neighborhood attributes like schools and crime, and real estate demand. With this model, you are not only comparing the square footage, number of bedrooms, and physical attributes of the house, but you're also comparing other intrinsic intangibles to ensure that the neighborhoods are similar in every way. What they found was that white neighborhoods with the same crime rate were still valued higher than black neighborhoods. White neighborhoods whose schools had similar low rankings as other nearby black neighborhoods were still valued higher than black neighborhoods. White neighborhoods with the same long commute time as other nearby black neighborhoods were, yes, you guessed it, still valued higher than black neighborhoods. The influence of racially unjust laws and policies is inseparable from all the other factors used to explain the disparities. In short, no matter how you slice it, there are stark racial inequalities in appraisal values, inequalities that have only gotten worse over time. It is emphatically unfair and a disgusting exercise to perform, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Black homeowners who are looking to sell their home or looking to refinance with lower interest rates or are looking to pull equity out of their homes are going through great lengths to remove the signs of blackness from their homes. This is the process of taking down all family pictures containing black relatives, removing paintings of black historical figures, hiding African decor, artwork, and artifacts. And it may seem kind of extreme, but couples have asked their white friends or white spouse to actually go through the process of showing the appraiser around. Black sellers are suffering from the black tax, and we're not highlighting this situation where you have a home in a black neighborhood compared to the same home in the white neighborhood. We are talking about the exact same neighborhood. Even in the same subdivision, some black sellers are accruing less value in their homes than their white neighbors would, simply because they are black. It's very sad. Be wary of appraisers who carry the same attitudes, beliefs, and prejudices of a system that designed to suppress our wealth and prosperity. If you're not strategic, they will choke out the equity in your homes in the form of low home appraisals. A couple in Jacksonville, Florida ordered an appraisal on their house so they could take advantage of low refinancing rates. After their first appraisal came in suspiciously low, the homeowners then made some minor decorating adjustments. In other words, they removed all signs of blackness and signifiers of their race. The second appraisal came back a full 40% higher. The Curtis family of Marin City, California also felt that they were lowballed in what they believed was a racially biased appraisal. They were in the process of doing a refinance. Their second appraisal, eight months after the first, resulted in an increase of $254,000, a quarter million dollar difference. The Mitchell family, a biracial Denver couple, ordered a second appraisal, but they didn't change anything except for one thing. The wife, who is white, stayed back for the second appraisal and walked through. The first appraisal came back in two months at $405,000. The second appraisal came back in just five days, but it was increased to $550,000. Abena Horton, who is black, and Alex Horton recently decided to refinance their Jacksonville home. They felt that racism was at play when they got their first appraisal back at $330,000. They felt that it was a low price compared to the other home values in their predominantly white neighborhood. 
For the second appraisal, they went through the process of whitewashing their house. They removed all of the black indicators, but left hanging on the wall holiday cards from white friends and oil paintings of Alex, who is white. They received an appraisal that was $135,000 higher when Abena Horton and their biracial son was not home. The devaluation of majority black neighborhoods is penalizing black homeowners in the tune of billions of dollars in cumulative losses. The amount of money that majority black communities are losing in the housing market and real estate is staggering. We believe that it's the enduring and detrimental effects of more than 400 years of slavery, Jim Crow racism, as well as the de jure and de facto segregation here in the United States. Many people in power at banks and financial institutions have internalized stereotypes, insults, and dehumanizing innuendos about black people, resulting in a widespread presence of anti-black bias, whether unconscious or not. We mention real estate appraisers, but oftentimes real estate agents and white home buyers themselves contribute to the continuing disparity in home values in black neighborhoods. If you feel that your home is being undervalued due to racist tactics, you can file a complaint with either the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, or your local housing authority. If you feel that your realtor is limiting your home searching due to discriminatory reasons, you can file a complaint with the National Association of Realtors. Also, when comparing your appraisal, you can also do your own due diligence. Double check your property with Realtor.com and Zillow to see that any upgrades you've made to your property, like a kitchen renovation, are highlighted in your home's profile. Unfortunately, the burden is on you to verify and challenge the appraisals if you think that you are being lowballed. And if you feel that you are the victim of unfair and biased estimations, stand up for yourself and order a second or third one. We appreciate the fact that you stayed with us until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss a video. Bye for now. We will see you tomorrow.